So I'm going to talk about property-based testing today, and I'm going to use the um, Haskell implementation of QuickCheck for my example. So just before I start, let me ask you, who would consider themselves a regular Haskell user? Okay, so many, but a minority, I think. So I hope that I will not use any very strange notation, but if there's something that uh, I forget to explain, then, then do just ask me. So property-based testing, quick check, I need to introduce it. Here's the um, Hello World example. Um, it's a testing tool in which, instead of writing individual test cases, we write general properties of code, such as this one. This is a property of the reverse function on lists, and we read it as, for all lists x's, if you take x's and you reverse it, and then you reverse that again, you end up with the list that you started off with. So this property says do the double reversal and then make sure it's equal to x's. This triple equal sign, it's like an equality test, but it's for use in tests. So it generates an error message um, if these two sides are not equal. And the property itself, it's just a function that you can pass any list to uh, in order to run a test. What we do is in the Haskell repo, or uh, in a main program, doesn't matter, we call quick check and we pass it this function as an argument. And quick check then generates, by default, 100 random test cases, and we run the test for each of them. So this shows you what happens in the case uh, when the property is true and the tests pass. Uh, to show you what happens when it fails, I have another property, prop wrong. And this one says that if you reverse a list once, you get the list you started off with. Of course, that's not true. So what happens when we test it, when we give this function to quick check, is that it reports a test failure, and then it shows us the counterexample, the failing test. So the output here contains um, one zero, that's the value of x's for which the test failed, and the second line is the error message that's generated by that triple equal sign. Uh, and it shows what reverse returned, which was zero one, and what it was expected to be, which is one zero. And of course, they're not equal. That's why the test fails. So notice here that the example we've got, one zero, the failing test, is very simple. And in fact, we'll always get either one zero or zero one here. Of course, that's not the first failing test case that QuickCheck found. QuickCheck generated some random list, probably much longer, that wasn't its own reversal. So why do we get this very simple test case? Because every time a test fails, QuickCheck then tries to shrink it. It tries to simplify it as much as it can, just as you would simplify a failing test, you know, if you'd found one some other way, until it ends up with a minimal test that can't be simplified further, but still fails. And this shrinking process ends up with simple test cases that fail where everything is relevant to the failure. And a large part of what makes property-based testing useful is that when tests fail, you get these very simple counterexamples to debug. Shrinking is going to be very important for today's talk. But I'm not going to talk about um, this kind of vanilla example. I want to tell you a little story now. And this is based on a true story, but I have changed some of the details. And uh, we'll, we'll, let, um, we'll change the names to protect the innocent. So I want you to imagine that you're implementing a cryptocurrency, and you're doing it in Haskell. There are people who are really doing this. And uh, what, what are the, some of the things you would have to do? Well, one of the things that you would probably want to do is to define a type of coin amounts. So here's a Haskell type definition, and the values are going to be things like coin2, coin3, coin4. A coin amount contains an integer, but it's different from an integer. Um, why have a separate type for amounts of coins? Well, because you can't use just any integer as a number of coins. There's, generally speaking, a maximum number of coins that you are allowed to have. And this max coin value in reality would be billions or trillions. But just for the sake of illustration, I'm going to say, let's suppose that the maximum coin value is one million. So now, of course, some coins will be valid, some coins won't. So let's suppose that we have a validation function that just checks that the number of coins is between zero and the maximum. And let's think about what operations we're going to want to have on these coin quantities. Well, one of the things we're going to want to be able to do is to take two coin amounts and put them together, right? 
So we have to have an add function. And here's the definition of the add function. So what's the difference between this and just adding integers? The difference is that you might overflow. So addition might fail. And I've represented that in this code by returning Haskell's maybe type. So I check, does the sum of the coins overflow? If not, I return just, that represents success, and a coin containing the sum. Otherwise, I return nothing to represent failure. Okay, this is very, very simple code. But it still has to be tested, right? And I want to test it with quick check. Now, how would you test this code? Well, maybe it's not obvious what properties to write, but I'll bet you can think of some unit tests. In fact, I'll bet you can think of two unit tests in particular that you would like to write for this code. Here's what I think you're thinking of. One unit test, the first one, just tests the normal case when you add two coin quantities together. So I've written down here, if you take coin two and you add it to coin two, that's infix application of the add function, the result must be equal to just coin four. Okay, so that, that tests the successful case. And of course, I must also test the overflow case and check that add really returns nothing when the values overflow. So uh, that's what the second test does. I take a coin with a maximum coin value and add one to it. And of course, that must return nothing. Okay, now once I've defined these two test cases, of course, I can, I can actually pass them to quick check and uh, it'll run them. Uh, there's only one test in each case and uh, of course they pass. They also, by the way, give 100% coverage of the code of add. So if coverage is your goal, hey, we're done. However, we would like to write properties instead, right? Now, the very tempting thing to do here is to say, well, I've got two unit tests. Why don't I just generalize each unit test a bit? And we can do that. So here I've taken the two tests and I've written two properties. Okay, so the first property tests the normal case of addition, and it says that when you add the coins, the results you succeed, and you get just and a coin containing the sum of A and B. But of course, this property only holds if that sum, A and B, is within the correct range, if it does not overflow. And that's what the line in red is capturing. That's a precondition to the test. And the way that QuickCheck implements this is it generates test cases without taking the precondition into account. But if it finds that this precondition is not satisfied, then it discards the test. It doesn't run it. So we only run test cases that satisfy the precondition. And the second property does the same kind of thing. Uh, it says that if we expect an overflow, then we add the two coins together. We must get nothing. OK, I can't quite run tests yet. I have to write a generator for coin values. This is how we write a test case generator in Haskell Quick Check. We give an instance of the arbitrary class. And the arbitrary definition there, that defines my generator. And what are valid values for coin? Well, they're any integer in the range 0 to 1 million, right? So I've just uh, chosen a value uniformly from that range and tagged it as a coin. That's what this code does. Um, oh, by the way. There is a risk, of course, that I might screw up when I write a generator. So whenever I write a generator of this sort, I will also write a property that just checks that every generated test case actually is valid. Okay, so this property at the bottom is going to be given coins generated by this generator, and it's going to check that they really are valid. And that's just a way of making sure that uh, we stay safe. Given this stuff, I can now run the tests and instead of just running two unit tests, I'm running now 200 tests, uh, 100 normal cases and 100 overflow cases. So this is, so far, this, this is what happened in real life. Um, but you can see here, oh, by the way, I still have 100% coverage, so that, that's great. You can see that lots of tests are being discarded. But in each case there, I found 100 tests that satisfied my precondition, and I just discarded 96 others. So that means that the testing is not as efficient as it might be. And so the developers who wrote this code thought, well, we don't want to be discarding so many tests. 
So let's instead... Oh, yeah, why are we discarding them? We're discarding them because of this precondition that's written there. So let's instead define a new type of normal test cases. Okay, the type definition just says that a normal test case contains two points. But we'll define this type so that there's an invariant that the two coins in this type always make up a normal test case. And that will mean that the precondition will always be true, so it won't discard tests anymore. And how do we do that? Well, we have to write a custom generator. Here we are, there's a bit more code here. What's this doing? Well, first of all, it's choosing coin A arbitrarily using the previous generator, but then it's choosing B very carefully to make sure that the sum of A and B will not overflow and then just packaging them up into a value of the normal type. So once I define this generator for normal types and rewrite the property to expect a normal type, then when I test the property, all the test cases will pass the precondition and testing will be more efficient. And so the developers did this for the normal case and the overflow case. So let's just think about the code that we have to write to do this. We have to define a new type, this normal type for normal cases. We have to write a custom generator. There it is, where we choose B very carefully. We have to do the same thing for the overflow cases and a different custom generator where I've chosen B differently to ensure that I get an overflow. By the way, I'm now generating test cases without using the first generator I wrote to generate the second coin. That means those second coins might not be valid. So I also have to write some properties to check that both coins in each case actually are valid coins. You might think this code is so simple, it's not necessary to write those properties. Well, I'm glad I did, because when I tested the overflow one, after 900,000 tests, I found it can generate this test case in which the first coin is zero and the second is a million and one. How come I've generated an overflow case with a million and one, which is not a valid coin in? Well, let me tell you this. If you're going to generate a pair of coins which when added together must overflow, you better not choose the first one to be zero. Because if you do, you've pasted yourself into a corner. There's no valid coin you can construct that when added will give you an invalid coin. And I, of course, I haven't thought that. So it's important to do these, these tests on the generators. And so if you think about it, we, I started off with a unit test. I generalized that into a property, which is quite easy to do. But to make it efficient, I had to define a custom data type. I had to write a custom generator for that data type. I had to write tests, a custom validator for that data type to make sure that I'm still generating valid test data. It's quite a lot of work. And I had to do this, not just for one unit test, but for both. And if I was starting from more unit tests that my intuition tells me I should write, well, I have to do this again and again and again. It's a huge amount of work. And what's more, I'm always going to face this question. Well, are the generators that I write correct? They're kind of tricky code. I've now got many copies of my property. Are they consistent? If somebody changes the code and changes one property, will they remember to change the others? I've got a lot of different generators for different cases. Do they cover all the cases together? Or are there some that are covered by no generator? To figure that out, I have to reason about a bunch of different generators. And I don't like reasoning. I like to let QuickCheck do my thinking for me. But here I have to do an awful lot of thinking. So I've written a lot of code whose correctness is not obvious. And worst of all, none of it is reusable. Next time I have an idea for a property, I have to start again at the beginning. So this really wants to make my, make me, it makes me want to tear my hair out. It just seems the wrong thing to do. So what should we do instead? One property to rule them all. I want to take all of my unit tests and combine them into a single property. So here's what I suggest for testing addition. 
let's just write one property, no preconditions, that adds together any two coins, and then checks to see if I were just, just to add the numbers, would I get a valid coin as a result? If so, then I should get just that coin. If not, then I should get nothing. So this, this code clearly can test any possible case. It covers all of the cases. Um, and you get 100% coverage from this too. But it's much, much simpler. OK, but you may be wondering now, have I really captured your intuition? Those two unit tests that it was obvious we should write. Well, sort of, but here's a question. This property clearly can test both combinations of normal cases and overflow. But does it? There's a possibility, because there's only one property now, that all the generated tests were the normal case. Or all the generated tests were the overflow case. We don't know anymore. So that doesn't quite correspond to the intuition. So what should we do? Should we go back to multiple properties? No. What we should do instead is label the tests. This is something that QuickCheck has supported for a long time. So I've added that red line of code to the property, just saying I want to label the test case with a string computed by this summarization function. What does summarize do? Well, it just looks at the sum of A and B, and it decides are we in the normal case or the overflow case, and then returns the corresponding string. When you label a test case like this, then QuickCheck will display the distribution of tests we actually ran when we finished testing. So in this case, uh, more or less 50% of the tests are normal, 50% are overflow cases. That's probably all right. So I'm happy. So this is the way that one should use one's unit test intuition to label test cases and see how often each unit test idea is being used. OK, do we have any more intuition, I wonder, about the tests that we would like to run on ad? Well, how about this? The add function essentially enforces a boundary, doesn't it? A boundary between the normal cases and the overflow cases. Is that boundary in exactly the right place? If you were writing test by hand, you would probably write some tests that fall either side of the boundary, just to make sure that it's in exactly the right place. Correct? Was that intuitive? So, how will I um, use that intuition now to improve my testing? Well, it's a unit test idea, so I won't change the property. I'll just change my labeling function. Let me label all the test cases that are within two of um, you know, the, the boundary as boundary cases. And let's just see how often they get generated. Ta da Wait a minute. I ran 10,000 tests. There was not a single boundary case. Oh dear. So intuitively, it's important to test this boundary. And my property, despite running a huge number of tests, has entirely failed to do so. So my testing is nowhere near as good as I thought it was. So what can I do then? Well, let's think about how we are generating coins. I put this generator up. I said, you know, the range is zero to a million. We'll just choose something in that range. Nobody objected. But if you were writing tests by hand, where one of the inputs was in the range zero to a million, this says any number is as good as any other. Is that how you would work? Or are there some values that you would be careful to make sure you test? So. Common testing practice is to say, well, if you can input a range of values, make sure you test the first and the last one. Make sure you test values at least close to the boundary, the extremal cases. This generator doesn't do that. This generator assumes that one number is as good as another. So maybe what I should do instead is generate like this. 
So here, what this code does is, first of all, I choose a non-negative number n, and um, the, the default picture it generates is two fairly small numbers. So n will be a small non-negative number. And then I'm going to generate my coin by choosing uniformly between three alternatives. The first alternative is just to return this small number. This will give me values close to the lower end of the range. The second alternative is going to be to return the max coin value minus that number. This is going to give me test cases close to the upper end of that range. And the third case, I'll still do what I was doing before. So it's also interesting, perhaps, to try any number in the whole range. So let me just include that as a possibility. So this is probably a better way to generate coin values anyway. But what's more, I want to, when I add two values together, I want to get more boundary cases. Well, when I add a, val a coin that's been chosen by the first alternative, so it's small, to a coin chosen by the second, it's near the end of the range, there's a good chance that they're going to fall near the boundary, right? So this is not only a better generator, probably, uh, for coins considered in isolation, but it should give me better results from uh, the addition property. And sure enough, if I run tests of the addition property, would you know, the very first one fails. So the code is wrong. And the counterexample here uh, is it comes when you add a coin with value 1 million to a coin with value 0. And the third line shows us what happens. The left-hand side is the actual result from add. So add adds these two coins together and says, I fail. The right-hand side is what we expect, which is that you succeed and you get a coin containing 1 million. Why did that happen? Here's the code I showed you earlier. Look at the red bits. In the valid coin function, I assume that a valid coin can have any value less than or equal the max coin value. In the addition function, I compare to see if a plus b is less than the max coin value. So there's an off by one error here. Now, it doesn't matter which choice you make, but you have to make one choice and be consistent about it. Um, so I could fix the add function by changing that to a less than or equal. And if I do and run the tests again, then we'll see that now they pass, and now I'm getting uh, a little over 4% of boundary cases. Is 4% enough? I think it probably is. In any large number of tests, there'll be a lot of boundary cases. That will test pretty thoroughly that the boundary is being put in the right place. So here is the idea that you take your intuitions about what unit tests you would like to write. Don't throw those intuitions away just because you're doing property-based testing. But don't write single properties for each test. Generalize them all to one grand unified property that tests everything. But for every unit test idea, turn it into a label that you can label these test cases with. Once you've done that, then you can look at the distribution of tests. You can see, are we actually testing each of these ideas reasonably often? And if not, you can tune the generation in a way similar to what I've just shown you, so that you get each thing you want to test being tested reasonably often. So here's a method for thinking about how you develop an effective property. The first property I showed you was not effective because of the generator. The new property is. But of course, if it's a method, it should be applicable to more than one example. So let me show you another. This is also quite simple. Um, I have written a little library for finite maps. And uh, here's an example of using it. Uh, I can convert a list. This is a, a list of key value pairs. Key 1 has value A. The key 3 has value C. And I can turn a list into uh, a map. And I'm going to display maps in a kind of set-like notation uh, to make my examples easy to read. And of course, there are a lot of operations on these maps. I'm going to test insertion. So, uh, in this case, if I take this map T and I insert the key 2 with the value B, then I should get a map containing keys 1, 2, and 3. OK, so the implementation, by the way, is actually ordered binary trees. So here's the tree representing the first uh, um, 
symmetry there, the T. If I insert 2 and B into this, then I take the new key value pair, compare the key to the root of the tree. I have to go right in this case. Compare to the key in that, that node, I have to go left. Um, now I've reached the end of the tree, and so I create a new node. Okay, so we know what, what we're doing. So think a little bit. What unit tests would you write for the insert function? Anybody like to make a suggestion? What cases do you want to cover? Yeah, thank you. So the ordering is important, right? I'm going to focus on that to begin with. Um, I'm going to want to test smaller than the keys in the tree, larger than, somewhere in the middle. I feel I should have a test for each one of those. So that's my first intuition. So let me start working on a property here. So one awkward thing is that when I write a unit test for insert, I can predict exactly what the result should be. So I can write the conventional kind of unit test with an expected value. But when I write a property, I'm going to be inserting things into random trees, which I don't know in advance. So here we see the tree in my, the test I showed you and the resulting tree. But how can I tell whether the resulting tree is correct or not? I don't want to have to try and predict that value. To do so, I'd have to um, implement insertion into a tree. And so my test would be the same as my code. I don't want that. So what I'm going to use is a, a very uh, powerful technique, very useful for testing this kind of code. I'm going to take the two trees, before and after, and I'm going to convert them into a simpler data structure. In this case, just an ordered list of pairs. So if I take the tree beforehand, I'm going to convert that with a toList function into the list containing the 1 and A and 3 and C. If I take the tree I get afterwards, I can convert that also into a list. And now, even though it may be hard to predict exactly what tree I should get, it's easy to predict what list I should get at the end of this. I can just use list insertion into an ordered list. So we call this uh, using lists as a model for the more complex data structure. And uh, you can think of it as using this as a reference implementation. But it's just there to judge the correctness of uh, the tree implementation. And I can convert this into a property really easily. Here it is. Um, so this property of insert says if I'm inserting a key value pair into a tree, well, I should get the same list whether I do the insertion first and convert that to a list, or first convert to a list and then use list insertion, except for one little wrinkle. And that is that list insertion can result in duplicate keys, whereas insertion into a finite map can't. And so that's why I've thrown in the delete key function there that we just Make sure that I don't get any duplicate. Okay, so here's my property. Now, let me add some labels corresponding to those unit test ideas that I started off with. So I'll just do the same thing I did before. I'll add a line to the property that says label each test case with the result of this summarize function. And I define summarization like this. If all the keys in the tree are greater than or equal, the key I'm inserting, then I'm inserting at the start. If they're all less than or equal, I'm inserting at the end. Otherwise, I'm inserting in the middle. And da da, this is what I get after 100 tests. And we can see that 80% or so of generated tests are inserting somewhere in the middle. About 10% are at the end, 10% are at the start. That's probably okay. Okay, so can I be happy? Well, there is a problem here. The problem is, how do we know that that code I wrote was right? I went pretty quickly over it, but it's kind of tricky. If you're not a regular Haskeller, you might not be completely certain that I've done the right thing. And what happens if I get this code wrong? Will I ever find out? All that happens is that I'm putting labels on tests that don't really represent what the test is testing. I look at my statistics, they look fine, but that doesn't really tell me anything because the statistics might be using the wrong labelings. So really, I would like to test this labeling and make sure that when I label a test, middle, for example, it really is inserted into the middle. I'd like to see some examples of tests with each label. 
And this is a new feature that Haskell QuickCheck has not previously had. You can now take such a property and just say, give me some labeled examples. So if I do that, I'll get an example of inserting at the start, inserting at the end, and inserting in the middle. And these are just um, tests reported in the same way that QuickCheck always does. So if we look at add end, for example, it says we're inserting the key zero and the value zero into this map that just contains minus one. And uh, the final line, it's the one produced by the triple equal sign. It just says when we convert to lists, here we are, we get the same result on each side. All the tests pass. So those, the last line always contains two equal values. And if we look at these, right, look at at end, sure enough, zero, zero is being inserted at the end of the test. That looks good. Look at middle, zero, zero is being inserted in the middle of the map. That looks good. Look at that start. Here it is larger. What's happening here? Is this inserting zero, zero at the start of the map? But this is not what I had in mind when I said I wanted to test inserting at the start. This is inserting into an empty map. Is it really at the start? I, su I suppose in principle, it's at the start, it's also at the end, but, um, but it's not what I wanted. So how come, how come this is the example I'm given? Because my labeling function labels this test as being an at start test. And how come this gets reported? Because quick check reads the Bible like Satan, as we say in Swedish. This is a saying, and what it means is that Satan may read the Bible. He may follow the rules to the letter. But if there's any way of perverting the spirit while still following the letter, Satan will choose it. And quick check shrinking kind of does the same thing, right? So shrinking said, do we need any other elements in the collection to label this at start? No. Throw them away. So that means when I see at start being reported, I don't know that I'm really doing an interesting test at start. I might be inserting into the empty collection. OK, so how can I fix this? Well, I have to make my rules clearer. So let me add another case to my summarization function that says, if the Tree, if the collection's empty, I'm going to label this as an empty test, not an at start test. And if I do that, and I ask the labeled examples again, now I'll get the same test I had before, but it's labeled empty. That's fine. And now I get a real at start test. What? It's, there still aren't any other elements. No, no. I, I didn't say they had to be different, did I? And so what do you know? Um, Satan has figured out that it'll, it'll work to put the key and value that I'm, all, I'm trying to insert in the tree already. And then, sure enough, my labeling function says, this is an insertion at the start. But it's not what I meant. OK. So actually, looking at this example is quite illuminating, isn't it? It reminds me that there are really two different kinds of insertion. There's insertion that inserts a new key, and there's an insertion that updates the value associated with an old key. Maybe I want to try both those situations at the start, in the middle, and at the end. Maybe I shouldn't have started off with three unit tests, but six. So let me change my labeling function. Let me just add some more information to the label. That's the red code. But I'll keep the label I had before, and then if it's not empty, I'll look and see, is the key I'm inserting already an element of the keys in the map? And if so, I'll say that this is an update kind of insertion. Otherwise, it's a new kind of insertion. And when I change my labeling this way, then that start, at start uh, test gets split into two. The one I saw before, that's the first thing on this slide, um, which is testing the update case at the start. And the second one, which is the test I wanted, all along, which is inserting a new key at the start. And sure enough, so there's the update and the insertion now really is inserted at the start uh, of the list of the collection. Okay, 
So now, finally, I think my labels mean what I intend them to mean. And now I can look at the distribution of tests. And uh, if we look at this, what do we see? Well, we can see that uh, most tests are inserting in the middle. 60% of them are inserting new keys. If I were to try and tune this, I might try and reduce that a bit and do more updates. A very small number of tests are um, updating elements at the start or end of the list. But still, you know, one and a half percent, that means if I run a few hundred tests, I'm going to hit that case. So perhaps this is all right. Okay, now, here's something you might be tempted to think. You might be tempted to think, I've done a lot of work now to classify my tests. I've got seven interesting kinds of tests. And I've got seven labeled examples. Why don't I just save those examples and run those in my test suite instead of running QuickCheck? It'll be much faster. Will it work just as well? Well, just to illustrate that, let me show you the code of insert. There's the data type at the top. The rest of the code is the function definition. Um, if you read Haskell, you can see that it's just, you know, it's the usual binary tree insertion. This is the correct version of the code. Let me show you a buggy version. You saw the bug, I suppose? No? Correct version? Buggy version? Correct? Buggy? No? Where's the bug? It's in the last line. When we're inserting a key that is already in the map, and we found the node containing it, and the bug is actually here. This is the value that we put back into the resulting map. And I've written V prime there which is the value taken from the previous version of the map. It should, of course, be the value that I'm inserting. So this is, this is an easy typo to make, just an extra prime. But the effect is that when you try to use an insert to update an existing key, it's a no-op. The update doesn't happen. This code is obviously buggy. But it will pass all seven of those saved unit tests. Why? Well, let's look at one of them. Here's the, the example that's saved for doing an update in the middle of the sequence. Look, I'm inserting zero, and the, the zero key is already present. But the values in both cases are zero. So I'm testing update by replacing a zero by a zero. Of course, that can't detect this fairly plausible bug. And why? Why do we have zero in both those places? That's Satan. If I run quick check, of course, it's going to generate different values. And very, very quickly, after 14 tests, it reveals the bug in this update function. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is don't let Satan write your unit tests. Okay, so I've talked quite a lot about um, labeled examples. Um, so labeled examples lets us see what our labels mean. It lets us debug the label. That's really important. I haven't talked so much uh, about tuning, but let me talk about one very common way in which tuning can break. We'll go back to the, um, the coins example. Remember, I worked really hard on my generator to ensure that boundary cases appear sufficiently frequently. So here's what might happen next. Next month, somebody else might work on this code. They might add a new operation, maybe multiplication of a coin by an integer. And then they'd write their own property. And they'll start optimizing their distribution by changing the same generator. Are they looking at my distribution while they're doing that? Of course not. So if all that happens with these distributions is that I eyeball them and decide they're OK, then somebody else can screw up my testing totally later on, and nobody will know. What can we do about that? Here is the code that I used for collecting those labels. So I've got the summarization function up here. I'm going to show you a different way of collecting the same information. 
So to do that, I'll need a little bit more space. I'll take away the labeling code that I had before, and I'll add the labels in a different way. So what classified does is it labels a test case with a string if a given condition is satisfied. And if you look at the conditions in those three calls of classify, they're exactly the same as the conditions in the definition of my summarization function. Likewise, the strings are the same. So this code is doing almost exactly the same thing as the summarization code I had before. OK, if it's doing the same thing, what's the point of changing it? Well, this code tells QuickCheck about each label separately. And that means I can do something else. I can replace this classification function that just adds a label with a coverage requirement. And these coverage requirements say they classify in the same way, but in addition, the boundary case must occur 5% of the time. The normal case must occur 40% of the time. And the overflow case must occur 40% of the time. So if I do that, I put my coverage requirements into the property where they will be checked every time I run the tests. So when I test this property now, if the coverage requirements are all satisfied, it just behaves as usual. But if there aren't enough of a particular kind, I get an error message. There we are. You see, this time I got only 4% boundary cases. I expected 5%. But if you look at it, you'll see quick check still says, OK, past 100 tests. So this is not a test failure. You can put this test into a test suite, and it's not going to cause other people's tests to fail. Um, but, you, but you can see if your requirement is not met. Now, you're probably thinking, huh, what good is that? There's going to be a message in the test log somewhere that nobody will ever read. Sure. So why isn't this a test failure? Because this can happen just through bad luck quite often. Right? If you keep running these tests, sooner or later, you'll run 100 tests. You don't happen to get five boundary tests in that run. We don't want that to call somebody else's check-in to fail in the continuous integration setting. No, no, no. If you want to be sure that the coverage criterion is not met, you have to do this. You ask QuickCheck to check the coverage criterion. And if you do this, QuickCheck won't just run 100 tests. It will run enough tests to be certain that those coverage criteria are not met. So this is a failure. If somebody screws up your generator, when this test that checks coverage is run, it will cause the test suite to fail. And as you can see, we had to run, in this case, 51,000 tests to be able to say we are not getting 5% boundary cases, and that is a statistically significant result. Now, what do you do when this happens? Well, you might now change the generator to get boundary cases more often. Perhaps that's the obvious thing to do. Or you might say 5% was a bit arbitrary anyway. Maybe 4% is OK. So if I change it to 4%, then QuickCheck will run even more tests, 100,000. And then it says, yes, we are getting 4% boundary cases. We know that. We're confident. It's statistically significant. Now, the reason I had to run so many tests is that I chose a requirement that was very close to the actual number. Uh, we can make life easier for QuickCheck as well. If it's enough to have, say, 1% of boundary checks, then since I actually get far more, QuickCheck will be very quickly satisfied that um, you know, we're getting enough boundary tests. If I say I want 10% boundary tests, which I'm obviously not, then once again, QuickCheck will be able to very quickly determine that we're not getting this number of boundary cases and cause a test thing. So this check coverage thing, this is something that is very new in Haskell QuickCheck. I think it's really important. How can you figure out how many tests you need to run? You have to read this paper from 1943. And this paper, when it came out, it was immediately classified because it was so important for the war effort. This is military-grade statistics. But luckily, you don't have to read it because we have. And QuickJet knows how to do this. But there's still one question we have to ask ourselves. Whenever you draw a statistical conclusion, you need a certain confidence level, right? So, you know, psychologists, if they can draw a conclusion with 99% confidence, that's great. But what does 99% confidence mean? 
But it means you'll be wrong 1% of the time. So this, these check coverage tests, they may be wrong sometimes. So we need to think about how often is it OK for a test in a test suite to fail when there is no bug? While you're thinking about that, I just want to show you a quote from Agile Borat, my favorite tweeter. I can't do the accent, but he says, my friend Azamat is a very good developer. He has always had all unit tests green. If unit test is fail, it is removed. Is best practice. But you know, Agile Borat is right. There's a name for tests that fail occasionally. They're called flaky tests. So if one of these coverage tests fails the first time, maybe somebody will spend a few days investigating. And they'll conclude, actually, there was nothing wrong. What's going to happen the second time that test fails? It's just going to be deleted. But those tests are important to prevent properties losing their effectiveness. So how often is it OK for a test to fail when there is no bug? Here's my claim. Never in the lifetime of the project. So what confidence level do we need? One in a million? Suppose you've got 100 developers. Suppose they each run the test suite 10 times a day. That's 1,000 runs a day. Suppose the test suite contains 100 coverage properties. That's 100,000 tests a day. If we use one in a million as our confidence level, this bad thing is going to happen every 10 days. That's not acceptable. So quick check uses 10 to the minus 9. We're more like particle physicists here. And maybe that's enough. Maybe 10 to the minus 12 might be better. I'm a little open about that at the moment. But nevertheless, that's a good thing. You can change it. But 10 to the minus 9 is a good default if the project is not too large or too long. Yet. So I'm teaching you a method here. I'm teaching you, when you want to test something, think about the unit tests that you would write. Generalize them to one property that rules them all, but label the tests so that for every unit test idea, you have a label that tells you how often that occurs. Use labeled examples to debug your labeling. You will get a shock the first time you see the test that Satan can produce, I guarantee it. Once your labeling is correct, gather statistics. Tune the distribution. Once you've got the distribution you want, write those coverage requirements into your properties and make sure nobody can break them without finding out. If you do this, you will use your intuitions to build truly effective property-based tests. Thank you.